The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I am the host for this podcast. Uh, Before I get started, I want to remind you to please subscribe to this podcast and give us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also check us out on YouTube. When our guests are willing to be videoed, we are making videos and we would like to get more following even on YouTube. Now today's episode is audio only, but it will still be on YouTube if that happens to be a platform you go to to listen to music and watch videos. So please subscribe on both places, wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. That helps people find us and get the message of hope and help. Today's episode is episode number 152, and today we're going to be interviewing Nick Ferguson. Nick grew up in the inner city of Miami, an area colloquially known as the Projects, and was around drugs quite a bit, but grew up to play football, professional football in the Canadian Football League, the National Football League in Europe, and finally the NFL here in the United States. And now that he is a re- he is retired from professional football, he is giving back in the area of drugs and helping to educate youngsters and adults, especially athletes, on the dangers of drugs and the alternatives that are there to handle injuries and things that happen during professional sports. Currently, Nick is one of the hosts on 1043 The Fan in Denver. Let's talk to Nick Ferguson. So Nick, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate you being willing to tell your story and enlighten us on what you're up to these days. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Nick, tell us your story, how um, obviously you played in the NFL, but tell us how you got there and my, my role was to the NFL was uh, a role most athletes uh, wouldn't take. And when I would talk to some of my uh, teammates later on and I would tell them the role that I had to take to get to the NFL, usually the, the normal reaction is, man, I would have stopped a long time ago. But once again, <laughs> that was the difference between, you know, how I, I was raised and the situation that I came up in. And it just spoke volumes to how I wanted to kind of get out of my situation. And, I mean, I grew up in, you know, Miami, uh, you know, just my mom and, you know, my, my uh, five brothers and sisters. And it was kind of tough for her, you know, being a single-parent mom. And for me, you know, there were, there were dr- drugs everywhere, right? When I mean everywhere, I mean everywhere. And in, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, I mean, I, I couldn't walk uh, down, uh, down the street without seeing maybe a drug dealer or an arrest or uh, a drug deal going down, or even, you know, at, at times seeing, you know, crack actually on the, on the floor, on the ground, in the bag. And wow. for me, I knew at, at, at a young age, I had to uh, escape that environment. And there, was, there were certain ways that uh, I could actually do that, you know, academically and athletically. And I know majority of times in my, my neighborhood, neighborhoods uh, like mine across the United States, most people say, well, you know, usually African-American kids only have, you know, sports and entertainment. So I say, well, if you are given uh, a gift, why not use that gift to change your life and the life of your family? So for me, uh, I went on to walk on at a college called Morris Brown College in Atlanta. Now, I did that because I only had one scholarship offer in high school because I was a late bloomer. My mom didn't want me to play football uh, because she thought it was uh, too physical of a sport and I would get injured. And I, to kind I can of give relate you, to that, being a mom. I can relate to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, and, and, I, and I know, and to give you a quick story, to put it in perspective, uh, one, she didn't want me to play football because she thought I was going to get hurt. So what happens? I get hurt. Right. My mom takes me to the, the, the doctor and, and, do, and we're doing all those things and She takes me back to practice and walks me on the field as the team is breaking down. 
And she tells the coach in front of all the players that I'm done. I'm not playing anymore. And I'm, I'm looking at my mom like, wait a minute, we didn't have this conversation in the car. So you should have <laughs> talked to me about it, you know, before you start making these, these decisions that impact my life. So I was not only shocked, I was embarrassed. So when we walked back to the car, I started to cry because I'm just like, you know, hey, mom, how, how dare you? How do you how dare you take this away from me? This is something that I want. So my mom said, look, she got out of the car, took me back. She was like, look, if he gets injured again, you guys are going to take him to the to the doctor. So I said, deal. Right. <laughs> so that was kind of the conversation we had about, you know, almost the beginning and the ending of my football career. But once again, I was able to parlay that into uh, one college offer, which, you know, I, since I was a late bloomer, people didn't really know a lot about me. And I went to Morris Brown. I walked on there. And I realized, you know, my love of football was bigger than what I thought it was. So I realized that Morris Brown wouldn't provide for me athletically the exposure I needed to get to where I needed to go. So I had to start looking to transfer. So I walked, I walked over to Georgia Tech. This was kind of a two, three-month process, trying to look at the campus, uh, trying to uh, get the proper paperwork, financial aid to transfer. And I eventually transferred to Georgia Tech, and, and that was an ordeal within of itself because some of the coaches didn't really look at me like, you know, I was a viable option because, hey, I walked on at Morris Brown, a Division two school, and what's wrong with this kid, Nick Ferguson, who thinks that he can, you know, come from a Division two and transfer to a Division one football, which that's unheard of. Guys usually don't do that. They normally go from Division one to Division Two, never uh, the opposite way. So, you know, I went through a couple of things, um, you know, fighting my way uh, academically and athletically to uh, make it at Georgia Tech. And, and I, I will be remiss if I didn't mention that. I did make the dean list, dean's list a couple of times at Georgia Tech, so I'm really wow. proud of that. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm, well I'm, I guess I'm Yes, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of that because at the end of the day, I knew that if athletics didn't work out for me, I needed to have a strong academic foundation. And Smart that's man. one of the reasons I, I, I chose to transfer to Georgia Tech. So things at Georgia Tech was kind of you know, slow and steady. They didn't all go the way I wanted them to go, which led me to being a free agent in the NFL. And being a free agent in the NFL, it's, it's, very, it's very hard. It's almost like you're kind of like the step kid. Everyone knows you. But no one really wants to give you a shot because there's once again there's a disbelief in you. So once again, because I'm used to grinding, I'm used to hard work. You know, my hard work paid off. Um, I got injured my first year in the league as a rookie. Had to sit out. Went to Canada for a couple of years to make my jump back to uh, the NFL and. Uh, it, it was a tough road. At I will be lying to you if I didn't tell you that there were moments where I was a little, you know, discouraged. Is is this for me? And will I get my break? Because it just seemed as though every time I took two steps forward, some, something was knocking me back down the ladder, right? right? And during that time, I had the chance to see a lot of things. And we all handle... Uh, barriers and frustrations and hurdles in different ways. I've seen guys use uh, uh, resort to using alcohol as a way of helping them through things. I've seen guys, you know, use other narcotics to help them through the, the, the tough time. But I just knew for me, based on the type of person I was and I am, I can go down that direction because that would derail me off of uh, my track. So, um, by me making those right decisions, it just put me in the right situations. Right. Nick, I want to stop you for a second because I, I, I'm stuck on here. I want to go back to when you were a kid. And so mm -hmm. here you are, a young African-American kid in the projects, I think is the right mm -hmm. way to call it. And you're yeah. surrounded by drugs. What? I'm, I'm curious if you can tell me what made you not go down that road. I mean, the peer pressure in that type of situation, I would just think it would be so strong to just do what everybody else is doing. 
what 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 in your mind said i'm not going to go down this road did you observe it did you like observe kids on drugs and not want to be like that i'm just i'm trying to understand well um it was a difficult environment when it's when it's all around you and people are talking about it people are using it people are selling it and it seemed to be somewhat of a cool trendy thing to do hey listen if you're not if you're not doing this with us you're not cool at all. And at that time, you know, when you're growing up in early childhood development, we all want to be accepted by our friends and by our peers, right? Exactly, but, yeah. But, but, but for me, I, I didn't have that the desire to be accepted by someone else to make me feel whole. It was just like, look, if they can't accept me for who I am and I'm not doing what they're doing, then they were never my friends to begin with, right? Wow. And... I, I knew early on, once again, by seeing how drugs would affect the families in my area and then seeing my own family members who were, were locked up in prison because they were on drugs. And usually when people are transitioning from jail back to you know reality, they go through to these places called halfway houses. Right. And after that, then they have to be, they have to be partnered or sent to a family member where they feel as though it's a great environment. Lo and right. behold, a lot th- that place, that environment was my house. Right. Right. So, so I saw a lot of my aunts and uncles come through our house as they were transitioning back into reality. So I would ask them questions, and these were people who I looked up to as a kid. And then I just would talk to them and see how their lives were derailed. And I'm just like, man, I don't want that. Right. So it was like. I had to come up and devise a better plan to say, okay, well, Nick, the route that they chose uh, wasn't the right one, right? So you have to devise a right route to get out. And the way that it was in my neighborhood and a lot of inner city, you know, ghettos is the drug dealers, or or I call them street pharmaceutical reps, uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, the street, the street pharmaceutical reps, were the, the the star athletes. They were the movie stars in my neighborhood. And kids aspired, you know, to be like them because they had the flash, the cars, the money, the clothes, the women, and that's what we saw at that time. And I, right. listen, I would be lying to you if, if I didn't tell you at once upon a time I thought I thought that same way. I'm right. like when when you don't have when you don't have a lot and you see people that have certain things, you want what they have. Right? right, but but the way that we were being shown was the wrong way, and that that's why I was like, you know what, I have to find a better way. H- how do I do it? And I started to look at, okay, well, what skill, what God-given skill sets do I have? How do I expand on that? And I was always a precocious kid, very small, always asking a lot of questions. So it was it was academics, and I have to say this: there was a teacher that I had. Uh, two teachers, one in third grade, Miss Owens, and my fourth and fifth grade teacher, Mr. Shirker. Now, Miss Owens was an African American woman. You know, old school. She she didn't play around. And Mr. Shirker was he was an anomaly. He was he was odd. The reason he was odd because he was this you know you know white gentleman who seemed like he was a hippie type of guy in the inner city school. And typically you, you didn't, we didn't have teachers that, that, that cared. And right. he was one of those guys that, that definitely cared. And he made me by, by the things that he did care about education. And this is where the power of teachers and, and leaders, you know, uh, and role models come in. So, so for, for me to get to this point of being Nick Ferguson, who you talking with, there was a lot of people that put in work that helped me along the way. So it, w- it wasn't just me. I had to make the decisions, but, but, but those people helped out. And I, I, I'm, I'm speechless. I mean, I just think the fact that you chose the route you chose, I think is awesome. And I like to hear that there were teachers who influenced you. I'm guessing maybe your mom too? Oh, yeah. You know, my mom... <laughs> Man, my mom is amazing. And the reason that she is amazing because my mom herself, when she was younger, she was 
in a similar type of environment, right? Yep. But of and she she's one of fourteen kids. Wow. Right. But she was in the, the environment. I mean, she was in the environment where it was happening in her house. She could see it, right? right? She could see it. Yeah. But never once, never once did she ever use. And because she didn't, that kind of, you know, filtered down to her kids, my brothers and sisters, where, you know, we didn't use. Right. And I, told, I tell her everything I am, I owe it to her because if she used like the parents of the other kids in my neighborhood, Nick Ferguson would have never happened. Right. Right. Uh, it's an amazing story. I, I, I really thank you for going back and, and giving more perspective on that because, you know, the fact that you didn't go down that road, I think is, is just, it, I mean, it's amazing and it's fabulous that you're where you're at today. So, now we'll fast forward to the NFL. Um, I'm. Did you observe um, any type of abuse of painkillers in the NFL? Well, guys use different different things, and some guys use a combination uh, of things. And you know, there's a former teammate of mine, and we've we've had uh, back and forth conversations over the years where we don't uh, agree as far as methods to handle pain, right. and any type of uh, you know guys talk about well anxiety and all this stuff. Um, I've, I've witnessed guys you know taking certain pills or even you know smoking marijuana as a way to deal with certain things. Now the, the, these are tr- teammates I, I know now. Uh, to this day, um, I, I say that they're good guys based on the relationship I had with them on the football field. But obviously, some of the things they were doing outside of the game, obviously, I couldn't take part in because that's not who I was. Right. But you, you, you do have athletes, you know, doing certain things to, as coping mechanisms to deal with what they're what they're going with as going through as a player, the business of football. And it would it definitely would frustrate with frustrate me, and I would talk to some of the younger guys about, hey, listen, you know, see what they're doing, don't emulate that. But yeah. some guys, you, you can only tell them so much because they feel as though they are an adult, they're adults, and they have their careers in their own hand. And I've watched guys just kind of their careers go down the toilet because of it. And yeah. you know, you want to say, see, I told you so. If you listen to me, then this wouldn't have happened. But I mean, I'm not that type of person, but I, 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 I've seen it. And, and there are teammates that I, I play with who careers were de- destroyed because not the fact that they were using them, that they started to traffic these drugs, right? Mm-hmm. So, 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 so drugs, uh, they, they, they get a hold of you, not just because you're using them, but because they become a crutch when you start to sell them as well right so it's it just one of those tough things you, you never want to see but uh I, i've seen it i've seen it you are listening to the addiction podcast point of no return for more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us go to our facebook page by the same name or you can email us at the addiction podcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I.org or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. 
Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. Okay. Yeah, because we interviewed a former NFL player, and from his viewpoint, with all of the injuries that he sustained, you know, taking painkillers was sort of part of the job description because he didn't want to be on the the bench or on the sick roster on a regular basis. So he took painkillers and sucked it up. Um, and while I don't know for sure that that is the reason that he was cut from the NFL, I'm sure it didn't help. And we also met recently a major league baseball player who was an alcoholic. And that was definitely one of the reasons why he got cut. So um, I don't think they got into selling it, but, you know, it definitely affected those two. So I understand. Well, well here's what I'll say about that. Um, playing sports, it, it, it's it's a great thing. And, and I love it because you, you get a chance to live out your childhood dreams and do things that you did as a, as a kid. But now there's a crowd, there's endorsements, and, pe- and they pay you for it. So I don't want people to think that uh, the game itself has been a direct cause of why guys have gone down down that road. Uh, it, it's, it's based on decisions, decisions yes. that guys have made as far as how they've decided to cope with what was going on. Now, if you play a sport, there's a, there's a possibility that an injury may occur, right? Mm-hmm. And that you, that you may be administered a certain type of painkiller. And then after you take them for a while, then your body gets used to it. Now you need a stronger dose. And to me, that's the downward spiral that a lot of – not not a lot of guys, but a couple of guys have gone through. I mean, there's a Hall of Fame quarterback who played in, in Green Bay, Brett Favre. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was known around the league. I mean, he was uh, addicted to Vicodin because he, mm-hmm. he, after games he would take the Vicodin and he would drink alcohol. And they tell you on the bottle – if you're taking a narcotic, a strong narcotic like this, don't mix it with alcohol, right? right? right. So it got to a certain point where he became addicted to it, and no one, no one really knew that he was. And when it came, when the story came out, everyone was shocked. And the NFL was like, "Wow, this guy, he's such a great player." But that tells you that guys have things that they deal with, and because of our macho bravado, we, we like to feel as though that that we can handle it by ourselves. You know, this is what men's supposed to do. Right. And for me, I take a different approach. I mean, if I had injuries, and I did, you know, you, you, you're sore and, and, and things of that nature. So I would, I would do, you know, acupuncture. I would go to the chiropractor. I would get massage therapy. All these things that you can legally do to help you deal with some of the, the body issues that you're dealing with. And never once did, you know, I think about using painkillers. And like I said, me and one of my teammates, we used to go at it all the time from a conversational standpoint as to do, why are you using this when there's other avenues and things that you can use instead of this? And it's just like, well, it helps me feel this way and whatever. I'm like, listen, I've been playing longer than you. My position is more physical than your position. And never once did I think of using this particular product. And I'll tell you this. um, I had a conversation with, uh, some of, some of my, some individuals who, you know, I, I work with. And this is an ongoing conversation. I've had this conversation with a lot of people. And you look at Major League Baseball. Recently, Major League Baseball took marijuana off his banned substance list, right? Yeah. But they put, they put opioids at the top of the list. And I, said, and, I'm, and, and I had a conversation with different people, and I'm telling them, hey, listen, that may sound like it's a great thing because things are legal, but at the same time, what's the impression that you're, you're providing – to young athletes who look up to these baseball players, yep. right? That's you, exactly you, you, right? You are you you were saying that this is okay to do, and I'm like, I can't do that. I can't condone that, right? Mm-hmm. And now it, it, it's I lived in California where it was legal. It's legal in Seattle. It's legal in Denver. But to mm-hmm. me, we, we have to be careful of what we put the word legal on because when you when you say it's legal. These individuals out here, they're using it because they tell you, well, it's legal, but do you know 
the long-term ramifications of using said painkiller, you know, alcohol or marijuana. And that's where the drug ed- education needs to improve. That, that's why for me, when I went down to the Super Bowl, I, I had to go back to my high school. I had to go back to my area and give this information about drug-free world back to my community. Yep. Wow. How did they receive that information from you? Well, it's, it's always a mixed bag when you talk to a, a large amount of people, especially, mm-hmm. you know, teenagers, uh, mm-hmm. because the idea is that millennials have a very short attention span, period. So yep. let me tell you something that I, that I did. So because I sat where they, where they sat and I told them this, uh, I saw a couple of kids throughout not really paying attention. And there were two kids in particular. So as I was talking, I actually walked up into the bleachers and stood right in front of them, right? Uh-huh. To, to let them know that I'm aware that they are not paying attention to me. And to let right. everyone else who was listening to me, let, me, let them know that here are, the, here are the two people I've identified. There's others, but here are the two people I identify. And after that, they started paying more attention to what I was saying. And after we finished, there were a couple of uh, administrators that came up to me, uh, some were Spanish speaking, and said that they would have to translate for some of their, their, their students, but they love, uh, they love the message. And one kid came up to me and said to me, he was like, he pulled me to the side, put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, listen, you know, I'm going through this right now in, in my house, in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. You know, people are using drugs and for me it was very difficult because I didn't know what direction to go right. because I felt he, he this is him talking to me that I felt as though I was doomed to repeat what was happening in my neighborhood but listening to you showed me that there's another route and I said man listen I mean I, I'm living proof that there's, it's another route but it comes yep. down to your your your, your decision making you have yep. to make the decision right so it, it, it was it was great, and you know there were there were there were other pockets of people coming up to me, kids coming up to me, kind of you know giving me their their story and how me providing this information and the fact that Marshall Falk was there with me as well, it kind of you know shed some light on a couple of things for them. That's awesome. Going into schools and talking is that something that you do in other areas, or or was it mainly just this trip to Miami? No, I, I usually I do it in different uh, areas. When I was in California, you know, I would do it all the time. Uh, I spoke at, um, I think it was my, it might have been 2017, right before L.A. Public Schools actually opened up. They had this big forum where they had all 340 leaders of the different school districts uh, at at a gymnasium. And uh, my wife, what we we did not, we did this on our own. We went down to. Uh, the, the L.A. school school district department and say, hey, listen, we wanted to help out. How can we help out? And they told us about this event, and I showed up, and I spoke to uh, those kids. So it, it's something that's always been on my heart and mind. Um, mm-hmm. And for me, when I think about it, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a teacher or a lawyer. But <laughs> my, obviously my athletic ability you know, uh, rang true, and, and I went in the direction of being a professional athlete. But here's what I, I realized about that. Because I'm a professional athlete, I can walk into any place, and people perk up and they listen right away. Yes, you can. Right? Yep. And that, that's, that, that, that's the power of having celebrity. Okay? Yep. Yep. So I said, well, if I'm going to have this celebrity, I might as well do something with it, right? It's like, you know, it's like, it's like having a superpower and not doing anything. Exactly. Right. So, so, so I said, well, I'm going to use my superpower to champion the causes of, you know, other people and mm-hmm. immediately listen. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about drugs, but when I go into schools and I, and I talk to kids, administrators and uh, parents, what here's what usually happens. Someone tells the kid, didn't I say that very thing to you the other day? <laughs> right. Yep. And, and the kid yep. shakes their head. But when it came from the parent, the teacher, the educator, whomever, they didn't listen. Right. But because it came from me, they were they all they were listening, you know? Because yeah. here's this guy who was an NFL guy 
and we aspire to achieve anything that he's achieved. So we want to listen to him and see what was his game plan. How did he do it? Right? Yep. So that, that, that is why I get it. And I told the kids I spoke to at my school when I felt as though some of them were not listening. I told them, say, look, I don't have to be here. No one's paying me to do this. I'm doing it because I want to. I could have right. gone to our rival high school to do this, but I chose to do it at my school. And if I'm going to do it, you're going to give me the respect and you're going to listen to me because what I'm telling you right now, I know it will save your life. Right. And that, and that's wow. always been the message. Wow. I think it's phenomenal that you do that. I really do. Phenomenal. So, Nick, one of the things I always like to ask people when they're on the podcast, we figure that those listening are either themselves addicts who need help or friends and family of addicts or possibly even friends and family of people that they don't want to have go down that road. So what message would you give those people? If you could give them one message that you want them to take away. Well, the message is communication. That, that, that's the big thing because we all go through trials and tribulations in life, right? Right. And right. we have decisions. That's the one thing we have that other creatures don't have. They, we have the power to decide. And we have the power to decide, well, we're gonna, we're, yes, we're going to do this, or no, we're not. And if you're going through something, whether it is uh, pain where you feel as though you may need painkillers or you're going through some emotional uh, distress in your life, you, you need to make sure you talk to people. Find someone in your family or maybe outside of your family that you can confide in that can be uh, a support system for you. Because a lot of times individuals go down this road because, one, they don't have the education, and, two, they don't have the support system. Right. right. So, so have people that you know that are not are going to aid and abet you. They're not going to tell you things that make you feel good about things that you're doing wrong. No, you want people who are going to be honest with you. Hey, yep. listen, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this, and here's why. Those yep. are the people you want in your life. So I would say, man, you talk to people. And even if you are currently addicted to something right now, still there's power in talking to people who are going to set you straight because you need to know that you, you, you are loved. No, no one wants you to go down a bad road by yourself and end up, you know, either dead and in, in jail. I mean, you don't help to your family. You don't, you don't help to society. So right. we, we have to try to do our best to rehab other people, even if we don't know them. And yep. sometimes so we can rehab them by just having a conversation because now you give them some, some perspective. Well, I didn't think about it that way. I didn't know there were other options out there. I right. thought I was the only one going through this particular situation. So you right. give them options and, you, and you, you show them. And the way you do that is by education. We can't make anyone do anything they don't want to. But my, my thinking is if we provide them with the right tools, the right education, then now they're, now they're armed even when they're not around you, right? right. So now they right. can say, well, what, what would Nick do in this situation? Well, mm -hmm. here's what he told me that he's seen and what he's been through. Maybe I should try to live my life vicariously, you know, through Nick in the way that he would have wanted me to, to live my life. So from this day, I'm going to make a commitment to myself. I'm going to get better. And that's the first th thing you have to do. You, that, that individual has to decide that they are going to get better. You have assistance around you. You have people willing to help you, but... You have to do the heavy lifting. And the first thing you have to do to admit that, you know what, there's a problem, but I want to get my life back on track. That's right. That's a great message. The other thing I just want to add in is um, you mentioned Drug Free World and drugfreeworld.org is a website for anybody listening that distributes free of charge um, in educational material about drugs called The Truth About Drugs. And if anybody listening has a question about painkillers or marijuana or um, heroin or any type of drug, really, you can get the information from Drug Free World. And I think, um, I, you know, you made the decision, Nick, when you were a little kid without this information. But I have always felt that if young people get 
this information, um, the truth about drugs, that they will make the right decision. And that's, um, I think that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. It, with anything, it starts with education. And I always yeah. tell individuals, hey, you don't know what you don't know, right? right. And even in my area that I grew up in, there there was bad information about drugs. Well, the drug won't affect you if you do this, if you do that, if you're standing up, if you're lying on your back, you know, the sun is out and the clouds are rolling through. And I'm like, that sounds stupid, right? right? And it's the misinformation that, that puts people in bad situations. If individuals really knew what the long-term effects of drugs were, I would like to think logically, logically, if we're talking about individuals who are setting some goals for themselves and it's, to, it's said to them, look, you can't achieve these goals if you're doing these things, right? right? Now, they, they, now they start to change their mind because that, that's where the direction is going, especially knowing that a, a lot of drugs are now being, you know, marketed towards kids now. Yep. So, so this, this – before everyone used to think that this was just an inner city battle. Oh, that's that's them over there. No, it's not. It's nope. it's us. Yep. It, it's 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 a us thing. And either you want to get on the train right now and try to prevent it, or you're going to ignore it and say that's not happening in my neighborhood. But here's what I'll tell you. And I've said this to a lot of affluent people in California when I lived there. You may think that you can move away from it. You may think that you can you know, put a wall up or a fence and kind of, you know, block out what's happening in the world. But no, at some point, directly or indirectly, it's going to impact your life. Yep. And by that time, it's too late. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, Nick, before I end off, my husband is bugging me to ask you, did you play in a Super Bowl with the Broncos? No, that's a very touchy subject for me because... Oh. Uh, no, because I, I, I didn't. I had a chance uh, in 2005 to 2006 season. We were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, they were the sixth seed, and I think we were the second seeder, uh, and they was for the right to go to the Super Bowl and play against uh, the Seattle Seahawks in Detroit. But we, 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 lost, we lost that game. And I'll tell you this, I mean, it, it is something that, I will never forget as long as I live because every year during, during the playoffs and uh, during the Super Bowl, I just look at other people I know get to that point and win, and then I'm disappointed because see, uh, this past season in Miami, Kansas City was playing in San Francisco. I coached for the San Francisco 49ers, right? Ah. So I know the coaching staff and I know a lot of the players. And with the, with the Kansas City Chiefs, there's a former teammate of mine who coaches running backs for the Kansas City Chiefs, and I know Patrick Mahomes. So for me, it was kind of a little mix of emotions. I was happy for them, but at the same time, I said, man, that was something that happened in my career that I never got a chance to experience, right? So that's why it's always a – I've learned to deal with it, but it's always a sore subject when it comes up because it's like, man, I had an opportunity, but now it's gone. <laughs> So, but yeah, but it's, well, it's, 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 a, it's all good. I'm Not sorry a that it's a bit bittersweet, but um, I will tell you that what you're doing now when you go to the Super Bowl is huge with doing the drug education. So thank you so much for doing that. Hey, listen, if, if I, the way I look at it now, based on what I just said to you, if I can get more people introduced to Drug Free World, Yep. And I get more people on board and educated. For me, that'll be my Super Bowl. Absolutely. I can live with that. Absolutely. I can definitely and, live with that. And I applaud you for that. Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. No problem. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Nick Ferguson. I thought it was fascinating that a young man with a background such as he has really was surrounded by people who... Uh, pushed him to excel in his academics and 
that even though he was surrounded by addiction, he didn't go down that road. So it doesn't have to happen. And I thought it was pretty stellar. Once again, if you want to listen to Nick, he is one of the hosts on 1043 The Fan in Denver. We're going to be back again next week with another interview. But in the meantime, please remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and also to listen to us also on YouTube. Watch us on YouTube, subscribe there, and give us a five-star rating so that people can find us. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again next week. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. For more information on Narconon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcononojai.org. Narconon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.